So good morning, good morning, welcome to worship uh, this Sunday after Easter. Uh, it's lovely to be with you, uh, it's lovely for us to be able to worship together in this way um, and I really hope that we encounter Christ uh, as we go through our service this morning. Um, first of all just to say a huge thank you to everyone who uh, joined us at our coffee morning to raise funds for Ukraine this week. Uh, that was last Wednesday at Settle Methodist Church. Uh, we raised um, close to £500, so about £480, I think, uh, in that endeavour. And I'm hugely grateful for everybody's uh, generosity uh, and support in that time. We will, of course, continue to pray for Ukraine, for the situation there, for the people there, uh, and for those fleeing that country in our service today. Um, but look, it's really lovely to be with you. I hope you managed to celebrate Easter. I hope you had a, a really lovely time uh, with family, friends, uh, or, or simply uh, participating in uh, one of our in-person services in church or uh, our services here online. If you enjoy these services, we'd love to hear from you. We're in discussions now about being able to live stream our services from our different churches just getting costs for that and it would be lovely uh, to be able to join you live from our services within the church um, and I look forward to that happening before too long. <laughs> um, but for now look it's it's brilliant to be with you. Uh, I hope that um, you felt God's presence uh, through this uh, Easter week um, and we had a brilliant time as well singing um, uh, songs of Praise, Easter Songs of Praise, uh, Limestone View on Wednesday. And I'm grateful to everybody who came along to that uh, to sing with us and with the residents at Limestone View uh, again here in Settle. Um, we're going to begin our service in a moment with our uh, first song, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene, which leads us neatly uh, into our readings for today, which talk of Jesus standing in the presence of his disciples. Uh, the meeting with the risen Christ in unexpected places and unexpected ways um, and their commissioning by Jesus for work that they had to do, for, for places that they had to go and for things uh, that Jesus would like them to, to go on and accomplish, uh, the plans and purposes that he had for them and for their lives. Uh, before we do that though, let's just pray, shall we? Let's be still before God this morning. Loving God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the gift of Christ, for his death and for his glorious resurrection. We thank you for the gift of grace with which he calls each one of us. And we pray that we might respond as the disciples responded, in the power and in the breath of your spirit, to be witnesses to all that we have seen and known. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, look, let's uh, sing together our first hymn. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Let's worship. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and free.
A oh, beautiful song that is, isn't it? it? It's one that just reminds us what a privilege uh, it is to find ourselves in, in the presence of God. Uh, what a privilege uh, Sunday mornings are <laughs> to, to stand before God and, and worship. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore our burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. But he suffered and died alone that he might not remain alone, that he would call us to himself, uh, redeem us and restore us to the presence of God. And so when with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvellous. <laughs> How marvellous indeed. Let's, uh, let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Love of God, we come together as people on a journey. We believe and we have doubts. We do good and we sin. We are imperfect humans, but still beloved of God. Love and grace, hope and faith, the essence of the one we call our God. And so we seek forgiveness and grace from the one and from those we've harmed. Assured of that grace, we're ready to grow again. And we yearn for a new way, a new perspective, a clear path. For though we're full of trust and full of doubt, we are here. So speak to us, God. Continue creating us. Continue creating in us and through us. Inspire our hearts, enlighten our minds and guide our actions. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, amen. Uh, so as I say, in our service today we're going to be looking at uh, a passage from um, John 20. Um, this is uh, after the, the morning where uh, Jesus has encountered uh, Mary. Jesus spoke Mary's name and reached out to her in, in all love um, that first Easter Sunday morning. Um, the most beautiful readings last week. Uh, today we're in the company of the disciples and, I, and I'm just reminded because we were using Luke's reading last week. I'm, I'm reminded because we're going to go on and talk about Thomas that of course it wasn't simply Thomas who didn't believe uh, Thomas gets a, a bit of a rap for uh, being the doubter, especially here in John's Gospel. But I'm reminded, you know, as we read Luke last week and uh, his account of resurrection uh, and that first morning, um, you know, the, the women, three or four of them ran back to tell the disciples all that happened. Um, and frankly, they didn't believe him. They thought their words were nonsense, I think is the expression <laughs> that Luke used. Um and it sounds like nonsense, doesn't it? It sounds like the sort of thing that we just wouldn't believe. If somebody came back and told us, we'd think, well, you, you just it's April the 1st, you're, you're having a joke, you're playing a prank. Um, and Peter, ever the impulsive one, I suppose, uh, rushed to the tomb uh, and stumbled in. He saw inside the tomb Jesus' grave clothes, strips of linen, lays on the floor. Jesus had fully emerged from the tomb. The, the grave clothes were no more, as we compared last week with Lazarus. Uh, Jesus was set free into a, a new creation, into new life, uh, his body raised. That would cause a problem, uh, of course, not simply for the Sanhedrin, for the Jewish council, not simply uh, for those who would suppress it, but for the Jewish council, we're going to hear a reading from Acts in a moment. The, the Jewish council was um, majority made up of Sadducees. And Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. I always remember Malcolm Duncan at Spring Harvest, which Pam and I and Harry went to for many years, um, had this phrase that he would say, um, the, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection, so they were sad, you see. <laughs> <Have> you... <laughs> well, I've remembered it since. There must have been something in it. <laughs> and so when uh, when Peter was preaching about resurrection uh, and the fact that Jesus had come back from the dead, 
um, the the Sadducees and the, the Sanhedrin would, would, I mean, they had double reason uh, to make sure that, that message didn't get out, uh, didn't get more widely heard. But the problem they had is that, of course, people were believing it and starting to hear it. Um, there's something wonderful about this time of year, uh, of course. Something that changes uh, not just the lives of those first disciples, but changes all of our lives as well. Uh, and our next hymn talks about that. It's a beautiful hymn. It, it's based a little bit on some of the prophetic writings of Isaiah. It speaks of a man of sorrows, um, but it talks about how those sorrows translated into uh, the most wonderful joy and redemption for the world. Let's sing together, Man of Sorrows. Gosh, what a, a lovely song that is, isn't it? Uh, really, really beautiful. Um, oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. There's no reason why an instrument of such pain and torture like that should be a symbol that I look upon with any affection at all. 
except that that's the place that my God showed his deepest, deepest love uh, for me, for you, for all of us. Uh, and so we rejoice in his grace, in his goodness, in his life poured out for us. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, Alleluia, praise and honour unto thee. We're going to pray now. We're going to pray for our church and for the world. We're going to pray particularly for the situation in Ukraine, for the people there, all who are struggling uh, on this day. Let's pray together. Loving God, in our prayers this morning, we bring before you the needs of our world. A world that needs to know the salvation of your cross, the redemption and restoration of hope. And so we pray for Ukraine. We pray for the people. We pray for the place. We pray for all of those who are waking up in war zones, fearing for their lives. The sound of sirens, the sound of missiles landing around them. Gracious God, may there be peace. And peace not simply in their hearts, though goodness me, that would be hard enough. But peace in that place. May the missiles be silenced. May the vehicles and machinery of war be set aside. Love and God, teach us the way of peace. Raise up amongst us peacemakers, those willing to stand against the forces that would disrupt, that would conquer. So we pray for Ukraine. We pray for your church in Ukraine. We pray for your church in Russia. We pray that they might speak with a bold voice of peace, of grace, of justice, of truth. And we pray for all those fleeing the consequences of this war, those who are displaced, those who are refugees, those who are waiting to come to this country, those who found sanctuary in other places. Love and God. May they know your peace. We thank you for the hospitality that's been shown to them. May they know your hope. May they know your peace. We pray for all who are fleeing at different places of war, of conflict, people who are fleeing from hunger, starvation, illness. We pray for all who are homeless, all who are displaced, all who are unequal in this world. We pray for righteousness, we pray for justice, we pray for mercy and we pray for truth. We pray for your church throughout the world that we might demonstrate your life, your value. Uh, loving God, we cry out for your spirit. Transform this earth that all might know your goodness and your love. Uh, we pray too then for our own communities, our friends, our neighbours, our local churches. We pray for all who are sick, all who suffer. We pray for those who mourn. Lord, we lift them to you and we pray that they might know your healing life. Breathe upon them the life breath of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Man of sorrows, turn our weeping to joy. Turn our darkness to light. Turn our lostness into hope, we pray. Uh, we're going to sing again. Uh, this is the, the really lovely um, Jesus blood, Jesus blood. Uh, let's sing together. A lovely song that is isn't it the beautiful words to it uh, we're going to hear our reading now um, our reading is from John chapter 20 uh, beginning at verse uh, 19 um, this is the evening of the first day so Jesus um, has risen that the tomb is found to be empty uh, Mary in the account of Luke last week and in the account of John um, that precedes this has been to the tomb and, and found that there's um, the stone has been rolled away uh, she goes back to tell the disciples in Luke's account we're told explicitly that the disciples um, don't believe her they think that the words that she and the other women say are nonsense um, John isn't quite so grating but he doesn't comment on it one way or the, or the other 
um, in verse 18, was simply told Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he'd said these things to her. We're not told whether they actually believed them or not. Uh, but what follows then is uh, the disciples all together. And, and I think one thing that we might understand from this is well, we often give Thomas uh, the label doubter, but, well, not many of those disciples first believed um, the account of the women and the stories that have been told to them. Uh, and it's only here now when they see Jesus for themselves that they start to believe and understand um, well, believe if not understand fully. Um, let's read together. This is John 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, uh, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Uh, after this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Goodness me, that's the most uh, wonderful reading uh, and the most wonderful grace shown by Jesus to his disciples, I think. Uh, Jesus stands amongst them. He goes to find them where they are. You'll remember last week we talked in Luke's account uh, about how the disciples went to find Jesus uh, how the women went to find Jesus and neither the disciples nor the women found him. We said last week that maybe it's not about us finding Jesus uh, so much as Jesus finding us. Uh, and here in this reading, here in uh, this account, the good shepherd comes to find a sheep. They're, they're locked in a sheep pen on this occasion and we're going to go on and touch on that story of the good shepherd uh, and what it was that he called them out to just to pick up uh, on that reading that we can uh, that we began last week um, Jesus finds them in a locked room for fear of the Jews uh, Jesus breathes on them receive the Holy Spirit he says but of course Thomas isn't there uh, and Jesus' grace, Jesus' love for his disciples, Jesus' love for the lost sheep is such that the next week they're there again in the same place. They have probably been out a little through the week, but they're certainly hiding from the authorities, trying to do as little as they could. That would be seen as little as they could. Uh, and Jesus stands among them again. You wonder this time, is this just for Thomas's benefit? 
Is this just so that he knows that Jesus has heard, that Jesus understands? There's a really lovely message in this, in our doubts, in our difficulties, in our struggles to accept and to believe. Sometimes in the hardest of situations, why things happen. Nonetheless, God comes and stands in our midst. We may or may not recognise him, but always when he stands there, he speaks peace. We're going to go into this reading a bit more and we're going to read on a little into Acts 5 uh, in just a moment or two. But before we do that, we're going to sing again. Um, And this is um, the lovely love came down, love came down. I will sing of love come down. Let's worship together. That's a lovely song. Um, well, we're going to go into the scripture uh, now and, and just uh, have a bit of a talk about it. Um, it's a familiar scripture. It's one that we'll hear each Easter. Um, I, I just want to bring a, a hopefully a different perspective to it by talking about um, one of the things that we read during uh, Lent, the story of Jesus as Good Shepherd, uh, his claim to be the Good Shepherd. Um But the story of the Good Shepherd doesn't simply talk about the the care the shepherd has. It's it's something about a shepherd's intention for the sheep. Uh, And I know painting us and disciples as sheep doesn't always put us in the the most um, complimentary light. Um, But I I do want to talk about um, perhaps the intention of the shepherd for the sheep uh, and what that might say to us about uh, this particular passage. Uh, in John's Gospel, uh, subsequent to the resurrection of Christ. Um, Let's just pray, shall we? 
Uh, Loving God, we thank you for your written word. Uh, We pray as we go into it now that you would lead us through it. Speak to us, loving God, of your purposes uh, for this word and for our lives. In the name of Jesus, our good shepherd, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus told his um, disciples a a story. Um, Very truly, I tell you, he says, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Uh, We talked about this passage a a few weeks ago and I just wanted to go back and just uh, dwell on it for a moment or two. Um, You'll recall possibly uh, if you heard that service that the the sheep, uh, what Jesus is referring to is is that the sheep would graze on the pastures uh, around the hills during the day. Um, They'd go uh, with the shepherd to graze and at night uh, they would be gathered in um, the, the hills were a, a, a wild place, a, a difficult place, um, and they were populated with wild animals, with um, all different sorts of things, but potentially they could be dangerous. Uh, there were all sorts of creatures out there that would attack the sheep, um, that would uh, kill them, eat them, uh, whatever else. So uh, it was the practice of the shepherds to, to bring the sheep back uh, to a, a central place um at night in the evening and at night um, and the sheep would be gathered into pens and they'd go into the pens where they'd be looked after just by um a, a smaller number of shepherds uh, while the, the shepherds who taken the sheep out by day for grazing uh, got some rest because the the sheep would come down into these big pens a smaller number of people uh, could look after them uh, and make sure that they were safe <coughs> Uh, and then in the morning, the shepherd would return to the pen and he would have a particular sound, a particular uh, call, a, a timber to his voice, um, a, maybe a, a particular whistle or something like that, but something that the sheep, his sheep, would recognise. Uh, they would recognise the voice of their particular shepherd because they'd grown to know it and grown used to it. Uh, over the days and years of their lives and so the shepherd would go into the pen and he'd call out the sheep um, and he'd lead them out of the pen and the reason he'd lead them out of the pen is well for grazing to I mean the 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 psalm tells it beautifully doesn't it to to lead them into green pastures uh, to set them beside still waters that they might lie down Um, because they were satisfied with all that they'd had to eat. The shepherd would care for them, he would uh, look after them, he'd keep them safe, but his job was to find them good grazing so that they would grow, so that they would be strong, so that they would be safe. (laughs) Now there's something about this reading uh, when I read it this week that just struck me of the sheep in the pen cowering for safety uh, hiding away from the the beasts the wild animals that would attack them they're in a locked room the disciples because it's dangerous outside Uh, into that locked room comes Jesus Christ comes the risen Messiah he speaks to them and they know his voice. He speaks familiar words. He speaks words of peace. His calming voice. The, these are words that the disciples have heard time and time again. You'll remember Jesus in the midst of a storm said peace to them. Fear not. You'll remember Jesus walking to them on water said peace to them. Fear not. And now the risen Christ comes to them, just as he'd come to Mary in the verses before, just as he'd spoken those exact same words to Mary, fear not. 
So the risen Christ speaks these words to his disciples, fear not. Uh, they recognise his voice. They know that this is Jesus stood amongst them. Jesus come to find them. The good shepherd come to call out his sheep and to release them from this sheep pen, this place of captivity that they're in for fear. Uh, to lead them out into open spaces <laughs> I mean we're going to be honest and say not always the safest spaces uh, we're going to hear a little bit about that later but to lead them out uh, their purposes their plans just as any good sheep were not to remain in the pens but to graze amongst the pastures so Christ came to call them he spoke words of hope. He spoke uh, words of life. As my father sent me, he said, so I am sending you. Your place is not here in this sheep pen. Your place is far beyond. Your place is out there. That you too might become shepherds, releasing people from the captivity, from these safe places. Jesus showed them his hands and his feet, showed them the wounds in his side. His words, <laughs> I'm not sure if they're encouraging words or not, as my father sent me, so I'm sending you. Immediately after he's shown them the wounds <laughs> with which he was hung up on a cross and killed. It doesn't sound like the greatest commission, does it? <laughs> it sounds like a very short straw. But Jesus then did something hugely significant in the context of John's gospel. He breathed upon them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. John's gospel, you'll remember, begins with this wonderful uh, proclamation of Christ uh, at the beginning of creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. If we look back to Genesis, to the creation of the, the first human beings, we're told that God, Genesis 2, 7, breathed his life, put his breath inside the creature, and Adam came alive. Now Jesus breathes exactly the same, exactly the same phrase, exactly the same terminology as that first creation. Jesus now breathes upon his disciples the very breath of life. Jesus' spirit, Jesus' breath is received by the disciples. And we, we've talked about this all through John's Gospel. Whenever we've talked about John's Gospel, we've talked about Jesus being a sign, being the firstborn, uh, as Paul said, of new creation. Jesus being the first to inaugurate a new creation. He was the, the word of God in the beginning, the, the creating, powerful word of God, um, spoken out across the world, but not spoken in a passive way, spoken in a powerful, creating, active way. A, a word that had... Uh, the ability to, to assemble and, and transform matter into creation. So that word spoken out was now spoken in the form of Jesus Christ into the world, a living, active, creating word, the, the sermon of God uh, preached to live in this world. But with all of its initial creating power, with all the power to create not simply first creation, but new creation. And so Jesus, the firstborn of new creation, according to Paul, breathes his spirit, breathes new life, new creating life. You'll remember John 3, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, except a man be born of spirit and of flesh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is talking about being born of spirit, having the life of the spirit of God breathed into our very souls, into the essence of who we are. 
And so Jesus breathes his new life, creating life, into the disciples. For just as he calls them out from the sheep pen, just as he calls them out into the world, so he gives them the power, he gives them his life, he gives them authority, he calls them from the cares of this world into the cares of the next. He calls them from old creation to new creation, from a fallen place to a risen place, to a place of resurrection and life, to share in his life with him. And so with the story of the Good Shepherds, Jesus says to them, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the sheep, I will lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus had a purpose for the disciples. He had a, a reason for going back to collect these sheep from this sheep pen and to call them out, not to just keep them safe all bunched up. He wanted to call them out because he had other sheep yet to gather and they were part of that process. They were part of that mission. And so we're going to read a, a second reading for today. This is a a, a wonderful reading. This is from Acts chapter 5. Um, and this is um, Peter. Uh, and um, uh, Here we are. Um, this is Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly, highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as they passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, remember who didn't believe in resurrection, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. In other words, don't be locked in this pen. Don't be uh, hidden away. Your mission now is out there. It's proclamation right in the midst of everyone in the temple courts. And so at daybreak, verse 21, they entered the temple courts as they'd been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers didn't find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. When we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Remember, they'd been there before. They'd been to a tomb and found it empty when they expected it full. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They didn't use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. You'll remember this, where, this is where Jesus also was called before Caiaphas. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, they said, verse 28. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. But God has exalted him to his own right hand as Prince and Saviour, 
that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Uh, there's something wonderful there about Peter's words. We are witnesses of these things. Uh, Peter didn't begin to tell his own story. This wasn't about Peter. Uh, none of the other apostles chipped in with, well, you know, I was there when he did this, or, or you know, Thomas, oh, I've put my hands and my fingers in his side. But this wasn't about the disciples. They were there to witness to Jesus Christ, to tell of the Jesus that they knew, to tell what they knew of him and about him. I think there's something deeply inspiring and powerful uh, about that testimony, about that witness to who Jesus is. Uh, often in our preaching, in our teaching, in our stories, we it's easy perhaps to, to get wrapped up in, in us for, to tell anecdotes and stories about, well, when I did this or when I did that. Maybe we simply need to witness to who Jesus is. I met Jesus and he turned my life around. I met Jesus when I was at a low point in my life, when I'd lost someone that I deeply loved. And Jesus met me and offered comfort and hope. I've met Jesus many times since, when I've been uncertain of the way forward, when I've been a little bit lost, when I've been confused. I've met Jesus too in times of great joy and happiness. Jesus has been alongside me in all of my life's journey. He's a faithful friend, a wonderful companion, a remarkable teacher. And the thing that I would say above all is that I know he loves me. And he'll never leave me. Maybe that's all we need to witness to. Maybe that's all we need to share. Jesus came and stood amongst the disciples that first Easter morning, uh, Easter evening. He spoke familiar words of peace. He'd come to take his disciples home to lead them out of their fear of their sheep pens, of captivity, of doubt, of despair, of purposelessness, to the green pastures of the kingdom of God. Oh, it sometimes meant they had opposition. It sometimes meant people were extremely jealous of them for the following that they managed to gather. But they never made that following about themselves. They were determined to be witnesses to who Jesus was, not to who they were. When they heard this, Acts 5, um, 5 verse 33, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people. We learn later in Acts that Gamaliel uh, was the, the teacher of Paul. So he was a very, very well-regarded rabbi. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. And he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, he said, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. For some time ago, Theudas appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all of his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. Uh, after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. But he too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, perhaps in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin... It will fail. If it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. 
you'll only find yourself fighting against God himself. Folks, if our movement, if our church is based on human origin, based on ourselves, our, our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own plans and purposes, then it might yet come to naught. If our church is based on being a witness to the goodness, the grace, the love and the glory of Jesus Christ, well then nothing can stop it. The Good Shepherd has come to release us, to set us free. May we wander through the green pastures of this world, telling all of the goodness of our Shepherd. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Love God, you, we thank you that you call us from our places of safety, our places of hiding into the wide open spaces of your grace and your mercy. May we be bold, Lord, with our witness. Breathe upon us the life of new creation, the power of your spirit, that we might share and testify to your goodness, not to our own glory. Love and God, be alongside us, we pray. For you are the one we love. You are our good shepherd. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing again our final hymn for this morning. I don't think it could be anything other than In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. Let's sing together.
Amen. In Christ alone, our uh, hope is found. Uh, thank you for joining me this morning. It's been lovely to share this time of worship with you. Um, and so let's just pray as we go from this place. Uh, now we leave this place of worship. While so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love and we know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is here, found in the space between all things, closer than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. And so may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon us this day and forevermore. Amen. And may we go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Uh, look, it's lovely to be with you again. Do tune in this evening uh, as Reverend Stephen um, picks up our Sunday evening reflections uh, for the next two or three weeks. Um, I look forward to seeing you uh, at a coffee morning, at a, a church service uh, in the coming days and weeks. Um, until we meet again, uh, God bless and have a wonderful week. Oh